Hi everyone, it's Jam, and today we have Laura Boykin. Um, I'm interviewing Laura Boykin. This is so amazing. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Uh, can you give a brief explanation of your work and what you do? Oh my god. Okay, well, first of all, I have to say it's so exciting to be here with you on your channel. It's like a serious privilege of, of mine and... Oh, it's such a cool day. Anyway, so as you said, my name is Laura Boykin, and I am the title I like the most. I hate titles, but the title I like the most is Ted Fellow. And um, I'm a, uh, I think I have a lab group here at the University of Western Australia, and we study cassava and cassava viruses and cassava whiteflies. Um, and as you know, or maybe you don't know, cassava. It's a tuber of a plant, and it feeds 800 million people around the world. And at this particular moment, it's being killed at a really fast rate by viruses that are transmitted by whiteflies. So that's sort of the problem we're trying to solve is we're trying to save the cassava in East Africa mainly, Tanzania, Malawi, Uganda, Kenya. And um, we use genomics and supercomputing to do that, which most people would not imagine would help, but turns out it does. So in short, that's what we do, and I'm sure you I think as a kid, I wasn't like a science geek as a kid, right? I loved to play sports and I loved my friends and I, I mean, I liked school. I wasn't in gifted or anything, but, and it just, I liked to be outside and digging in the dirt and looking at trees and flowers and whatever. And so that's, I think, one of the reasons I became a scientist. And this particular project, um, working with uh, farmers and scientists in East Africa, it just, it means everything to me. It's really, it's just so cool to use these science, my scientific abilities and the fact that I really care about people a lot. It just, it, this is why I'm, I'm working on this project. I mean, one of the things somebody asked me one time, you know, what, if you have one word to describe, you know, it gets you out of bed in, the day, in, in a day. And for me, the driving force in my life is equality. And I just feel like we're in 2016, there shouldn't be people that don't have enough to eat. You know what I mean? Like that's an inequality. Mm -hmm. And another inequality is, you know, scientists in East Africa don't have access to a lot of scientific literature or mm -hmm. softwares or computers or whatever. And that's an inequality. So those things are something that I'm really passionate about getting rid of mm -hmm. that inequality. So mm -hmm. that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was a great explanation. <laughs> it's long-winded, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no, that's great. That's that's excellent. Yeah. Uh, what are white flies? Also, how do they distort the cassava fields? So white flies and I'll maybe I'll send you a picture that you can you can incorporate on your channel. Yeah. Or splice it in or whatever happens in YouTube videos. Um so white flies are these tiny, tiny insects. They're a few millimeters. And they're in a family called the Hemip an order called Hemiptera. So there's, you know, this gigantic tree of life and they're they're an insect. And they're tiny mm. and they just transmit viruses. So they have this long kind of nose like mouth part. Mouth it is a mouth part. I can't believe I just said nose. I'm gonna get killed by scientists. Anyway, it's a modified mouth part. And it's, it pierces into the bottom of a leaf, and when it pierce, when it uses its mouth part to pierce in the leaf, 
it's transmitting viruses that it has stored in its mm. in its modified mouth part. So the thing is, it um, it's just this little insect, kind of like. I, when I'm explaining it to people, it's kind of like when mosquitoes transmit a malarial parasite to us, yeah. white flies are transmitting this virus to the plant and making it sick. And so you get this viral infection in these cassava fields and it just, it, 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 it really re- decreases the yield. And in some severe cases, the root itself, the tuber itself, will just turn to stone all the tissue inside just dies and then the farmer and the and people have zero to eat which is a massive problem mm, yeah yeah that that's that's very interesting why are african farmers devastated about this keeping in mind the fact it is their food what are the reasons so so for african farmers cassava is more than just food it's Um, yes, it's food, but it's also if they can produce enough cassava, they'll have enough to sell at the market to actually have income. And, you know, income makes life easier, as you know, right? So if they can sell, if they can have enough to feed their families, and then they have some extra, they can get some income that can pay for really important things like school fees for their kids, because education isn't free in East Africa, right, mm-hmm. that you have to pay. And if mm-hmm. your family doesn't have any money, then you don't go to school. And it's a really, it's a devastating cycle, right? Because mm-hmm. education is power. And if you don't have that, and mm-hmm. so the cassava itself, yes, it's food, but it's income, it's used for, it's, it's it, and another thing I might say, because somebody's told me, asked me before, well, why don't they just grow something else, right? Why do you need to save cassava? The thing is, Cassava, it's like telling Asia to stop growing rice, right? It's part of your culture. It's mm-hmm. important. It's you. It's just the solution is not to give them something that doesn't work in that region, right? And cassava is actually very um, low input. So it can grow with little water in extreme drought, um, high temperature. So it's a, it's a crop that if we can save, and it's going to help us with this changing climate. So it's multiple layers of why it's important other than just just food, which just food is a lot. But if they can have if they can have enough, they can really lift themselves out of extreme poverty, which is what we want. That's yeah, that, that's understandable. Yes. Um, how do you tag the white flies and know the extent of inhabitation around the affected sites? So I have to say that when it comes to doing a lot of the field work, we're in a big team of people. So we do a lot of genomics and supercomputing. And I have to give a big shout out to there's a team right now. If you go, if you look on Twitter and follow the hashtag Kasava Whitefly, you'll see our CSIRO team in the field right now surveying the extent of the whitefly damage, which is really, you know, that in itself, that question in itself is a big, it's a big question, right? Because you on the ground, boots on the ground, seeing where the white flies are, seeing what varieties of cassava host the most white flies. That's a huge, it's a really good question. And that's a whole team of, of scientists at CSIRO who are on our bigger team are working on that right now. And so they go out and they have, you know, strategies that they do for sampling a field. You know, they have this prescribed, look, we're going to get out of the van. We're going to go to the the cassava, we're going to turn over the first top five leaves, we're going to count, you know, there's all sorts of things that go into that. But I think the most important answer should just be that somebody's doing that. It's not me. (laughs) But I'm aware of it. I try to keep up with everybody. Just it's knowledge is power, right? So I try to understand what they do in the field. (laughs) Um, Are white flies infectious to humans? And if so, what damage can they cause? So there's been one in, or there's one situation where I've heard of white flies sort of having some impact on human. Like there's the uh, there's a side effect of not of killing cassava, but um, there have been um, reports and people saying that in high enough numbers, like if you're in a field or you're in a greenhouse and these white flies are there, a lot of people. Um, will breathe them in, right? So 
in high enough numbers in a population of, of cassava, you'll get farmers or scientists saying that they've had to wear masks because the white flies are going up their nose and in their mouth and all of these sorts of things. So that's, I mean, they're not going to, white flies aren't going to kill you, right? They're not going to transmit a virus or feed on humans or anything, but in high enough numbers, breathing them in is going to, I mean, they're even breathing them in isn't going to kill you, but it's going to be uncomfortable, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, what is the best solution that you found to exterminate white flies? So the best solution, that's, um, man, if we had, that's the million dollar question. It's probably the $50 million question. So the thing, one of the things, the cool things about science is that's exactly what we're trying to answer. And I think uh, all I, the best answer I can give for now is just the different avenues that we're going down to try to get the best solution. So, of course, there's this team I was talking about who's doing the work it's, um, out in the field now. It's about when are the white flies there, right? Are they there all year round? Do they just come after the rains? Are they, um, are they when the cassava isn't there, are they hiding out on beans that might be planted around the farmer? So... You know, the sol a solution could be plant your cassava later in the year, right? Yeah. When the when the white flies aren't so abundant, right? That could be one option that might work or might not work, right? So that's one one possibility. The second one is, you know, there's this idea of planting. So there's a field of cassava, mm -hmm. and then around the cassava, you plant some. Uh, Plant, you plant some crops that the, that the white flies love. So they'll go feed on the other plant like beans or something and they'll leave the cassava alone. So they call that a push-pull strategy. So you push the insects out of the field and pull them towards another crop. Um, and and maybe, that's, maybe that's a solution, right? Maybe, maybe that will work. Maybe that will help. Um, one thing that people do in the developed world, which is... Is, can sometimes be quite dangerous as they'll use insecticides. But if you don't follow a really strict regime with those, you can get the white flies to become insecticide resistant. It's kind of like antibiotic resistant. Then these white flies become like they're on steroids, and that's a bad idea. Another um, solution that people are working towards is modifying the cassava. So figuring out um, what genes will that the white fly has to have to live, right? If you can get rid of one of those genes, like if the plant just feeds on the cassava, sucks up something that's going to kill it, then you're done, right? So I can say that there are people doing... Oh, and then there's another solution, which I should say is, a, is an environmentally friendly solution, is figuring out there are things that will feed on white flies, right? Like these other insects will come and eat the eggs of the white flies. So it's a matter of, can you, they call them biological control. So maybe it's a matter of releasing some wasps into the field and they kill the cassava white flies and leave the rest of the insects there. So there's a bunch of different ways. And the short answer is we don't know what we're trying. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, what are you expecting in the future, like threats and operations? Threats and operations in the in the workings of the project. Oh. You know what I think the biggest the biggest threat. This is going to sound insane, but the biggest threat to success is scientists' egos, mm. because scientists are a hard bunch to work with a lot of times, right? They have this need to be famous for doing something, and in that need, the reality of who we're working for is lost. So for me, su success is we walk out to the field, every field we go to in East Africa, and the farmers have enough. That's success to me, right? That is the ultimate everything to me. That's what I'm working for. But you also have scientists who don't care about the end product, right? They care about getting a paper in science or nature or some something that's going to make them famous in a very limited circle of people. So for me, I'm finding that, yeah, working with other scientists is sometimes really hard. <laughs>
but I, well, we manage. It's about finding like-minded scientists and working really hard together. And I'm really, I'm so lucky that I'm surrounded by scientists who just absolutely inspire me. So, and make me want to work. And I just have this amazing group of friends in East Africa at, you know, in Tanzania, there's a group of scientists there that, you know, one of, one of the scientists there named Joseph Nunguru, he took us to his village just last month in Southern Tanzania. And we got to meet his family and meet farmers. And like, it was so real at that moment. I thought, you know, every job I submit to the supercomputer that might provide a solution to, to this situation is worth it. Right. Like all the struggling on the scripts and all the struggling on collecting the data, like, there's anything I can do to help this, I'm going to do it. And so that to me is all that matters. But when you have other scientists involved, sometimes they forget that that's what we're working for. We're working for those farmers. Mm. So yeah, success would be limited. I think would be hampered by managing scientist ego, which is, I don't think the answer most people would say. <laughs> but it's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for your time, Laura. No, are you kidding me? This is the best ever. I'm telling you now. And you know what? You can have, we, I can get you to talk to all the white fly people in the world on your channel. <laughs> people should subscribe to your channel and follow you on Twitter because, and I have to tell you, honestly, I'm absolutely inspired by you and your team and your channel and just it's such a cool it, you give me hope I know that this is not part of the interview but the fact that you care about this is so inspiring that's all I can say and all your friends that are even spending half of your brain thinking about this it just you know I just wish that more people would